In The God Who Weeps, Terrell and Fiona Givens explored what the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us about the nature of God. A Christ Who Heals explored how what Christ taught is reflected in our understanding of the Savior as members of the church. And in All Things New, they explore how the restoration affects our perception of a variety of gospel topics, from heaven to guilt and obedience. As I prepared for this interview, my gratitude for the restoration of the gospel increased, and it is my hope that this interview will do the same for you. Fiona Givens graduated from the University of Richmond with degrees in French and German, then earned a master's degree in European history while co-raising the last of her six children. She has worked in education, translation services as a lobbyist and as communications director of a nonprofit organization. Terrell Givens received a PhD in comparative literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is currently a Neil A. Maxwell Senior Fellow at Brigham Young University, but was previously a professor at the University of Richmond. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Jones, and I am so honored to have Terrell and Fiona Givens on the line with me today. Terrell and Fiona, welcome. Thank you, Morgan. Great to be here. Yeah, we're delighted to be here with you. Well, I have been so looking forward to this and I have tried to prep. You can imagine that prepping for a number of different books can be a little bit daunting, but we're going to try today to cover as much ground as we possibly can. And I just want to start, you both come from very unique cultural and religious backgrounds. And I just wondered if you could tell our listeners a little bit about your individual kind of journeys of faith and also just a little bit about where you come from. Yeah, absolutely. I was born in Nairobi and spent the first 12 years of my life there. So Africa is my home and I I have a very strong connection, particularly with Kenya. I I went to boarding schools in England with my brothers. They were Catholic. All of the schools I attended actually were Catholic. And I love Catholicism. It's it's a very rich tradition. It's a I love the liturgy, the symbolism. I I love Mass. I think it's just a really wonderful place. And and I I, I think actually all of the times I went to Mass prepared me for going to the temple, quite honestly, because symbolism, I, I mean, Catholics do symbolism really, really well. And we don't as a faith community. So I, I think that was really, really helpful. When I when I graduated from high school in England, we generally take a, ba- a gap year, what's called a gap year, and we go off and we either work in Africa in orphanages and then travel around the world with a backpack. I chose to go to Germany because I was going to be reading German for my my university degree, and I, I knew it was going to be a very intense program. So. I thought a year in Germany would help. At least I could get the language down. And it was while I was there, actually, that I I met a a lovely lady. And we we just had these conversations about God. And I really loved her ideas about God. And and we were just really good friends. And, And she didn't seem to be bored with the subject. So she invited me to church one day. It was one of those rooms on the second floor of a a building in in Wiesbaden. And, and I felt something uh, as I stepped over the threshold into the room. There was nothing religious about or churchy about the room at all. But um, I, I was struck by this feeling, which I'd never had. And, and I was struck by the light in the eyes of the sister missionaries whom, to whom I was introduced. And so it, it, was, it was a really illuminating conversion I think there were many instances where I felt the power of the Holy Spirit. And what really drew me to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the centrality of Christ. In Catholicism, he is obscured by a myriad of saints and primarily his mother. So it's very difficult actually to see him in behind that crowd. And um, that's that's really what you know attracted me. I, I felt that the LDS Church put Christ front and center. And I really felt that's where he should be. 
Absolutely. And I think that's interesting because I feel like sometimes that's something that people feel the opposite of when it comes to our faith. And I would love to get some more thoughts from you on that about how we make Christ the center. But I want to ask you one follow up, Fiona. I know you said in an interview that I listened to that it was very difficult for you to join the church because it felt like a disappointment to your family. And I think that's something that a lot of people listening can relate to. Can you share a little bit about that? Oh, yes, absolutely. It was catastrophic. And that's the only way I my uh, my decision to um, join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was just totally incoherent to my family they they thought i my father thought i joined a terrorist gang it 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 created deep rifts irreparable rifts in the family and it is a pain uh which i and a hurt which is very deep and from which i will never recover we just simply haven't been it just created this massive rift rather like the grand canyon and my family couldn't get over it. And uh, so, so, yeah, no, that was, that was incredibly painful. And it still is. It still is. It's mm-hmm. like we, uh, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm from Mars and they're from Jupiter. And you know, never the two planets will mix or converse. It's as though we're speaking. Well, as though I am speaking a completely different language, which my family, my family doesn't understand. Yeah. My grandma is a convert to the church. Her family, they were Southern Baptist. And my dad just recently told me that when she joined the church, her parents were heartbroken. And he said, I don't think they ever really recovered from that. And that was something I had never known. And so I think that that is something, like I said, that a lot of people dealt with and and they continue to deal with kind of in silence. And so... I love, Fiona, that you are honest about how hard that was. And I also love that you have remained so, so faithful. And I think that those two things are are tricky to navigate. Probably the most painful thing for my family, for my mother particularly, was the fact that they could not come, they could not attend my wedding. And that really, I think more than anything else that hurt. I'm a mum and I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine people saying, no, I'm terribly sorry, but you can't attend the most important, most significant event of your child's life. And I was the only daughter. And that's why, you know, I, I just, uh, I applaud. I'm so grateful for the fact that things have changed because I'm not the only one, obviously. Right. I mean, every single convert yeah convert who who had a temple marriage and and it, it's the same way there are so many people who are left out even if they are uh, members of the church or too young to, or to whatever they don't attend so for me that was a, a, a really wonderful breakthrough when the decision was made to no, let's, you know, ceilings are sacred in sacred places but marriages are for the family and for friends so I, I think that was a, a wonderful step. Um, my background is that I'm descended on both sides from a long tradition of ministers, both Presbyterian and Methodist. And yet by the time I was a young child, both of my parents had fallen away from their own faith traditions. And one of my earliest memories as a young child is I remember my mother sitting at the kitchen table, going through a phone book, looking up churches, just because she felt that our family needed a church. <laughs> so I can remember being taken to, to various denominations, various congregations, as my mother kind of led the way. Eventually, my father joined in too. So I have this tradition, this heritage that I'm very, very proud of, of my own parents being seekers and, and questers in their own regard. And they eventually landed in uh, the Church of Jesus Christ uh, of Latter-day Saints, and I have followed suit. Yeah. Terrell, I want to to ask you something about your upbringing. I heard in a podcast that you grew up in Lynchburg, Virginia. 
So I grew up in North Carolina and played in basketball tournaments in Lynchburg. And so I'm very familiar with Liberty and kind of that environment. And I can only imagine what it must have been like to be a young person growing up in that area and being a member of the church. Can you speak to what that was like? Yeah, that was a very, that was not a pleasant epic in which to be a Latter-day Saint living in Lynchburg. That was at the height of the moral majority years. Jerry Falwell was one of the most dominant religious figures in America. He publicly preached from the pulpit that Mormonism was one of the three isms that should be wasms. My family ran a small local business. We were blacklisted by Jerry Falwell and the, the entire population of evangelicals in the area. <clears throat> so, you know, we weren't physically abused or persecuted. It wasn't like Missouri in 1838. But I can say that there was a tremendous amount of hostility and opposition, and as I said, blacklisting, that, that made us aware of a kind of cost that came with discipleship in, in that era. And I think that that was very formative in many ways to my own faith and understanding of the place of the Latter-day Saint tradition in American history and culture. Absolutely. So I wanted to lay this groundwork right out of the gate because I think that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is that these unique backgrounds have shaped the topics that you've chosen to address and the work that you've devoted yourselves to in in this Latter-day Saint space. So how would you say, would you say that that's true? And if it is, how would you say that where you've come from has shaped your work in the years since? No, I, I absolutely agree. I think you would agree too, would you not, darling, that this has this definitely shaped this idea for me, especially of being an outsider. My family won't discuss my religious affiliation. They won't even mention it to anybody. But it was it was really good to be on that side and sort of be vilified for one's faith, beliefs. And it, it certainly acted as an impetus for me to dive more deeply into the gospel of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, because I felt that if I could, you know, show my family you know, these are really beautiful things. They're lacking in Catholicism. They're lo- lacking in the Protestant tradition. But this is a really beautiful, optimistic, generous gospel. And so it's sort of, you know, I, ha- I think I must have had my family in mind. But then it was just the joy, really, you know, that sees both Terrell and myself of being able to talk about and discuss and write about the things that are radically resonant within the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is a restoration. It's not a, you know, an elongation of the Reformation. It's, it's actually a restoration of a much earlier church, a church before Augustine, a gospel before Augustine, which was beautiful. The relationship between God and us and us and God and us with each other. And that has been the source of incredible joy for me. Yeah, I think one of the very particular ways in which my background shaped some of the questions we ask is, as a young 16, 17-year-old boy, you know, in the midst of this furious, fervent Bible belt, I was frequently accosted in the cafeteria or on, you know, the playing field. Have you been saved? Have you been saved? By many times well-meaning friends or evangelicals. But I remember even at that time, I just found that a very disturbing formulation what what kind of what does that mean about god that we start from this default position of disadvantage and antagonism and need rescue and it 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 wasn't just a matter of not appealing to me but ever after when i became because i i was only becoming active in the church really at that time we had joined been left but you know lost our activity many years ago but to this day, that, that question preoccupies me. Why do we continue to use this language, even in the church, of, of salvation and redemption, without really knowing most often what we think we're being redeemed for or from? And so that has been part, I think, of the impetus for Fiona and I to reevaluate the vocabulary that we use and what kind of baggage does it carry with it. 
Yeah, that's one thing that I have really appreciated as I've gone through and kind of revisited some of your work in preparation for this is that emphasis on vocabulary and the words that we use and how powerful those words are. Another theme that I seem to notice as I went through is that there seems to be this this connecting thread, whether it be the God who weeps or the a Christ who heals or your newest book, All Things New or Crucible of Doubt. And the theme seems to be what does the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ bring to the table about fill in the blank, whatever that topic may be. So where whether it's exploring what the restoration has taught us about the nature of God or what Christ actually taught, or in all things new, it explores how the restoration affects our perception of a lot of different topics like heaven and guilt and obedience. Do you feel that it's accurate to say that that is a common thread? And why would you say that emphasizing what the restoration brings to the table on those topics is so important? Well, N.T. Wright is a very popular writer, even for a lot of Latter-day Saints. I think he has a lot of interesting things to contribute to the conversation. But one point he makes, he said, if you change the story, you change the meaning of everything, all the words within that story. You change the plot, then you change the nature of the characters. And and I, I think the thing that amazes me the most and impresses me the most about the Restoration is the audaciousness and the comprehensiveness of the story that it tells. Right? That if you look up in a dictionary a definition of theology. It, it will say, you know, it's, it's the account of God's dealings with man from the Garden of Eden to, to resurrection. And I think that's not ambitious enough, right? And with King Follett and the Book of Abraham, we push we push the story back into a primeval eternities, extend it forward into unseen prospects. And as a consequence, it seems we just haven't gone far enough in recognizing how that radically reshapes what happened in the garden and what our understanding is of Christ's role and the meaning of atonement and redemption and all the rest. So I think it's, it's that overarching structure that continues to challenge us to re-articulate all of the individual elements of that story in light of that great saga. I suppose for me, I've, I've been putting my education in print because this has been a very educative process for myself, as we started, I remember many years ago, we were at Cedar Breaks and it was so beautiful and, and there was nobody there. And we had this gorgeous view of the mountains. And then not far from us with this very idyllic Swiss scene with a beautiful pond. And we just, you know, just what a lovely place to read in the scriptures. So the book opened to Moses 7. And it was, it was just quite extraordinary. I didn't feel... You're reading out loud to me. Yeah, I was reading out loud. That's exactly right. And I didn't feel anything. I just noticed that something was happening to the air as I was speaking into it. It was like the, the air was crystallizing. It was shimmering. And so I was thinking, I, I'm not a scientist, but I'm thinking, wow, this is really cool. Is this the altitude? Is this the moisture? What, what scientific thing is going on here? But we remember that really clearly, and it wasn't until later, actually, a sort of a moment of crisis for well, of me. Of course, remember what, tell them what you were reading in Moses. Seven. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it, it did grab me at the time. I was reading Moses 7, and I was, you know, we, we, I think we might have discussed a little this idea of the God who weeps, but I didn't feel anything. It was, it was a purely intellectual exercise. And it actually wasn't until I was in a period of crisis myself and I started to look at this wrathful, vengeful God. You were preoccupied with the genocide taking place in Africa. Yes, I, I had a crush on Bruce Willis at the time. And so I watched <laughs> Tears of the Sun. Don't anybody watch just lost that our film? <laughs> I just don't. Anybody don't watch? But, but it really was. I was uh, it was just shocking the genocide that was being, and so, you know, I just got angry with God. And I said, you know, I, I hope you're seeing somebody about this because I don't know how you can survive this trauma on an individual, familial, societal, and global basis. And I want you to know, I don't want to become a God if this is the result of it. And so I, you know, petulance, you know, stomped and fumed about. And when I calmed down, 
I, I had this very strong impression that I needed to read Moses 7 again. And it was then, in that crisis, as I was reading Moses 7 about the God who weeps, the vulnerability, Enoch's shock, that, you know, that he's seeing God weeping, and these aren't happy tears, obviously. Um, and, and that's when I realized that our faith tradition had something that no other Christian faith tradition was articulating, that God was vulnerable and that this was the greatest gift. He had chosen to love us. And by choosing to love us, he had opened himself to injury and hurt, as we all do. But that that was, I, I looked around my little pantheon of gods and realized that our God was the only God who did not require sacrifice from his children, but actually sacrificed for his children. And uh, and then that was really sort of the was really the starting point, wasn't it? It was. So I kind of came to everything from the outside in, and it was as if you reworked everything from the inside out. <laughs> well, I love that, and I love Fiona. I heard in an interview where you were talking about having had kind of a crisis of faith, and, and then you said, "I feel like I kind of have an ongoing." crisis of faith. And Terrell, in 2013, you wrote something called a letter to a doubter. And in it, you said, my main purpose in writing this letter is not to resolve the uncertainties and perplexities in your mind. I want rather to endow them with the dignity and seriousness they deserve and even to celebrate them. Would you both say that that describes much of what you've tried to do in the books that you've written together? Yeah, I think it would. I, I I would probably qualify with some kind of a parenthetical what we mean by celebrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've taken a few hits from that from people who think that we're glorifying doubt. We're glorifying doubt in its proper place, which is as a provocation to further searching and questing, not as a defeatist conclusion. And so that's what we mean. We celebrate doubt in the same way that we celebrate Joseph Smith's questioning what does this mean? Where am I? How do I know my place in standing before God? Nothing is making sense. And I, I think that for, you know, we, we have criminalized doubt for far too long in the church. And we have inculcated in our young people, like I, I, I witnessed the atrocity again this past Sunday of watching a father take a little child to the microphone and, and whisper into the child's ear what the child was supposed to say which is a terrible thing to be doing because what we are inculcating this formulaic pattern of I know, I know, I know. And that wasn't a pattern that we can observe in the early church. It's not a pattern we observe in scriptures, right? Nephi freely confesses, I don't know the meaning of all things, but I know God loves his children. The blind man says, no, I don't know the answer to your questions. I just know that I was blind and I see. So I think we are trying to re-legitimize a more earnest kind of wrestle with one's faith and recognize that it is healthy to consider our lives a perpetual state of faith development rather than a, a fait accompli. And as you said, Morgan, you know, this idea of you know, being particular faith crisis with that, it for me, it acted as a catalyst. It has always acted as a catalyst. Okay, dive deeper. Now, I, I, I don't have the years of tradition, family membership in the church as many people do. But I, I've always, when, for example, the story about the God who weeps in my row with God, it, it, it forces me or impels me to dig deeper. You know, just keep digging and. I think that's what we've been doing with all of the books. So it, it's not as sort of a celebration of doubt insofar as, but use that doubt to dive, you know, to dive further into it. Use, use your mind, your heart, your soul to seek these things out for yourself. Don't rely on what other people are saying, but, but tackle, um, jump in, jump into the scriptures. I, I really love Joseph Smith's expansive view of the truth that is to be found elsewhere, outside the faith tradition. You know, he famously said, in order to come out a 
pure Mormon. We needed to imbibe everything that was beautiful uh, about other faith traditions. And, and, and Terrell and I, really, uh, our faith has been bolstered by the literature we have read over, over time. And for me, Les Miserables by uh, Victor Hugo is, is just enormous. You know, to, I feel truth. So for me, the standard is, if it is true, it is beautiful. And if it is beautiful, it is true. So if something harrows the mind and constricts the heart, that I don't think is of God. That is not of the spirit. But if something, an idea, a thought, a song, a book, enlarges your mind and awakens your heart to joy, then we can know that that is true. And so that's sort of been our paradigm, wouldn't you think, darling? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and that's really been, yeah, that's been at the basis of everything we have done is just to gather all of these beautiful things that resonate so radically and so beautifully with us and incorporate them into our lives. Well, before I get to my next question, I just have to say, I think I speak for everyone that will listen to this podcast and saying that we're all jealous that that Terrell has you as his audio book reader all the time. But I want to, I love that you just said, you know, it's taking all of these things that, that feel true and diving deep. And you have done that. You've done that with a variety of different subjects and different things that apply to our testimonies of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I just want to touch, this is going to feel like we're flying through a lot of things that we could talk about. But I want to touch on just a few ideas that are expressed in these books that you've written. And so first of all, I love one line in in that you wrote that you said, the greatest act of self-revelation occurs when we choose what we will believe. You two are academics. And I heard where somebody was asking you about a statement that had been made by another Latter-day Saint scholar who said that they didn't feel that they had chosen to be a Latter-day Saint. That just was what they were. And you talked about how this is what you have chosen. So for two people that are brilliantly smart, why do you choose to believe what you believe? And why is that the greatest act of self-revelation? Okay, that's a rich question. And I'm glad that that's the last one and we can take the rest of the hour just on. <laughs> you can talk as long as you want. <laughs> so I would say three or four things about that statement. First of all, I would say I personally cannot understand how faith cannot be a choice or it can't have any moral implications or consequences. And religious preference is just a matter of the lottery and drawing a number out of a hat. We, there wouldn't be a blessedness associated with righteous faith and belief and perseverance if, we didn't ha- if there weren't a moral component to it. So to some extent, what we choose to embrace has to be a reflection of what we most deeply yearn for and love. So that's the first point. Second point I would make is that the scriptures themselves refer to the ability to believe without knowing as a gift. When the gifts are enumerated in section 46, one gift is to know, but another gift is to believe without having that certainty. I think it's a more beautiful gift because just as in marriage or any loving relationship, we're making ourselves vulnerable. We can't know the future. We can't know with any certainty what our standing is going to be in the universe the next day. But we we offer as a precious gift on the altar our trust and our confidence and our belief. And I believe that's what we do every day. We affirm our, our belief in God. And as far as why more specifically I choose this form of belief, well, the scriptures refer to, to the Spirit communicating to our hearts and our minds. And I don't think that's just a rhetorical expression. I think what that means is there are ways of knowing that are outside of and beyond purely logical or rational experience. And I feel that I know in those ways, as the Spirit has testified to me, of the power and beauty and goodness of of these principles. And I know in my mind, because as an intellectual historian and scholar of religious history, I can say unequivocally that I have never been able to find any theological system that is as radically moral and self-consistent and profound as 
the restoration revealed through the prophet Joseph Smith. So I feel like it's in my heart and my mind that I'm drawn to this gospel. Thank you for that. Fiona, would you add anything to that? No, I wouldn't. I think that's brilliant. (laughs) Okay, perfect. So I love also in the crucible of doubt, this is something I actually had a conversation with my mom just recently where we were talking about how we wish that there was a better understanding that the atonement is not a backup plan. Repentance is not a backup plan. And in, in the crucible of doubt, you write, the atonement is not a backup plan in case we happen to fall short in the process. It is the ordained means whereby we gradually become complete and whole in a sin strewn process of sanctification through which our father patiently guides us. You have said that the role of the savior in the plan of salvation is to shepherd us along in a process that has always been there and that is still very much intact. Why is it important, do you think, for us to understand that the atonement is not something that is just in case we fall short and and to understand that sin is an expected part of mortality? That was well said, that last sentence. Yes, no, that, that's actually a really brilliant question. I'm so glad you asked it. As Terrell said, if you, if you change the beginning, you change the end, and you change everything in between. For most of Christianity, what happened in the Garden of Eden was a ca- catastrophe, uh, as a result of which uh, we disobeyed God, Adam and Eve were rejected, their posterity was condemned, and then we had the you know the birth of original sin, and then Christ had to come in order to save us from our sins. But in our tradition, it's completely the other way, um, and, and of course Eve, for being the perpetrator of this catastrophe, has been vilified for centuries, and we as women, quite frankly, have not done well. Um, in our lives, in politics, in social um, constructs. But in in our tradition, it is so gorgeous. Even Eve is a heroine of the human family. And once you change her from villain to heroine, so for example, in Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 22, God says in response to Eve and then Adam eating the fruit, they have become as one of us. Now, most theologians um, will say, oh, well, he was being sarcastic. Ironic. He was being ironic. It was he, just an yeah. inspired scripture. Yeah. And, and it was because it, nobody believes that this was actually a step, an ascent, and that Eve is the heroine of the human family. And, um, and we see that repeated in Eve's Ode to Joy in Moses 5.11. Had we not eaten of the fruit, we never should have had children. So that was not happening. So that was a brave, courageous step that she took. I think she knew it was going to redound um, badly on her. But but then she follows it up. Had we not eaten of the fruit, we never should have had, had seed and we never should have known good and evil. Because in verse in chapter 3, verse 22, God says they've become as one of us, knowing good and evil. So if we take that in the Hebraic meaning, experiencing. And then in Moses 6, God goes on to clarify what he means by good and evil. He's speaking to the heartbroken Adam and Eve, whose children are are just running amok. And this is wonderful. I I think we will fall asleep in verse 53 in any of the chapters. So that's when we actually need to wake up because that's where the really good stuff starts. But the Lord spake unto Adam. So so he says that the children are whole from the foundation of the world. So that sort of deals with original sin, we think. And then the Lord says, um, inasmuch as thy children are conceived in sin. And then suddenly, this is like, what just happened? And uh, as a Catholic, I'm thinking, did God just convert to Catholicism? Because this is very Catholic language. We are conceived in sin. And then it gets worse. He says, even when they begin to grow up, sin conceiveth in their hearts. You go, okay, so this is very strongly Augustine, and I'm freaking out. And then he says, They taste the bitter that they may know to prize the good, which is exactly what Eve said. Had we not eaten of the fruit of the the tree of um, good and evil, we should never have known the joy of our redemption. 
So, so um, life is is difficult. It is hard. Um, some of us are wounded at birth. We are all wounded as we go through our lives. But God is saying this is important. There is something about about um, about the difficulty of living this life, about the suffering that is sanctifying. Or I can sanctify suffering. I can make all things work for your good. And and I, I just think that's brilliant, this idea of switching out evil to bitter. And, uh, and and this is what we are. We've, we ingest something bitter, it'll either poison us or it'll be so unpleasant we don't ever want to eat it again. And I just think that's a really... And that's the point. So that we, right. Thank we, you. We, we develop a taste for virtue and goodness right. and purity. And we can't develop that taste without having sampled its opposite and reacted accordingly. And that's, that's the educative intent behind life and the inevitability of sin. And and and, and our prophets have spoken, <laughs> Elder Elder Witso referred to Eve's decision as being a choice to choose that which was better. And and he says, you know, we all have choices in life. Some are better than others. Um, but if they if the choice you make is going to affect another person, then your sacrifice for that person is the greater good. And and, and, and it was beautiful. I should, says, should have it. And he said that was the case in Eden. Yes. And that was the case in Eden. It was an incredibly generous giving, knowing that this would probably not, not work out well for her, which is why I think she is given the title the mother of all living. So once you change that, Morgan, it's like everything changes. The vocabulary has to change. We're not redeemed, being redeemed from sin. We're not being redeemed for fall, uh, by the fall. And in fact, um, you know, God says that their work and, and glory is to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. That's it. It's optimistic. Christ comes to heal us from our woundedness. Uh, we are asked to collaborate with deity in our baptismal covenants in Mosiah 18. And so it becomes as we're not acted upon anymore. In the traditional Christian theology, we are acted upon. There is nothing we can do for ourselves. In restoration theology, we are asked, we are invited to collaborate with with the Godhead by taking on each other's burdens, mourning with those who mourn, standing, um, comforting those who stand in need of comfort. And that's a representation of each member of the Godhead, the God who carries our burdens all the way through his life into Gethsemane and on to Golgotha is God the Christ. The God who mourns with us when we mourn is God the Father. And the God who comforts us when we stand in need and comfort is, is God the Holy Spirit. So they are inviting us through these baptismal covenants to cooperate with them in healing the world and creating Zion. I've spoken for far too long. <laughs> no, no, no. That was so good. That was some great stuff. I wanted to ask you, so I know when the crucible of doubt came out, I have friends who say that their lives were changed forever by that book. And, and I know that it affected the lives of many members of the church. But I wondered six years later, if there's anything that you would write differently or add to that conversation surrounding doubt. Well, I'm wondering if that means, Morgan, that you have some suggestions for how we should do that. (laughs) You better believe I do not have suggestions. You know, nothing, nothing specific comes to mind, but I guess I could answer that question by saying a little bit about why we limited it to the topics that we did. Because there's nothing in that book that addresses, you know, were there horses in ancient America or what do you do with the book of Abraham? And and I think what we have learned in the course of our many, many interactions with fellow saints over the years is that questions often disturb members of the church without them really knowing why they're disturbed or if they should be disturbed. I remember one of the very earliest conversations that Fiona and I had with somebody struggling at the peripheries of the faith was a sister missionary about to return home. And she had, she was about to give up on, on her faith and testimony. And she listed one complaint she had in particular about the prophet Joseph. And, and I remember suddenly this, this, uh, this kind of inspiration hit me. And I thought to ask her this question, I said, sister, 
Can you explain to me why that question matters to your faith and testimony? And she thought for a minute, and then there was, there was just this great kind of illumination when she suddenly said, I don't know. <laughs> I just assumed that it should, because <laughs> that isn't the way that I've heard things in the past. And so that was kind of a moment of enlightenment, I think, for both of us, that we recognized that uh, you know, we tell the story in that book about this this fake lock on on a door in in the John Knox house in Edinburgh, uh, where there's nothing on the other side of the keyhole. It's just a dummy keyhole, and that a lot of our questions, I think, are like that. So, what we were trying to sort out in the Crucible of Doubt was how to ask more meaningful questions and how to avoid those assumptions that get us into trouble. I don't know if this is a uh, a grammatically correct term or not, but I think too often we overbelieve. We believe things that we don't need to. We've added all kinds of baggage to the fundamentals and cores of our faith, and 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 that's where we err. Yeah, I want to be sure that we get to some questions about your newest book, All Things New, and I want you to know how much I've enjoyed reading this. I feel like there are a lot of things that are helpful to things that specifically people in my generation struggle with. And it's interesting because I had a conversation with with a couple of my former mission companions where we were talking about why do we do the things that we do? And do we believe in a transactional God? What happens when the blessings that we think we, we will receive based on certain acts of obedience don't come? And you talk about a lot of these things in the book. And I just think that they are so, so good. So can you first tell me what inspired this book and how you chose the topics that you chose to address? Well, I think as you've already hinted, we saw it as an extenuation of a project that we had kind of begun unknowingly. Uh, I I remember the great breakthrough for us, at least in terms of writer's block, when we were working on The Christ Who Heals, was to recognize that we always talk around the peripheries of the faith, the doctrines and tenets and the beliefs. But if the core understanding of Christ as our healer was intact in 1830, there wouldn't have been a necessity for a restoration. And so that led us to ask, so what does the restoration bring to the table? Right. And again, once you redefine the plan of of, of happiness, once you have a new beginning, then as Fiona suggested, the role of Christ as healer rather than redeemer, or at least to to enrich the term of redemption by by adding in healer is, is useful. So I think that was... That was the principal motivation. And then we just tried to enumerate most of those terms that we had found in personal interactions with people had been troubling or or detrimental to them. And of course, one of the principal of those is worthiness. Actually, I I assigned a half dozen of my graduate students to make a list of those words that caused them the greatest distress in their own faith lives. And every single person came back with worthiness among among other terms. And I think for me, a great epiphany occurred some years back when I was reading the book of Job. And as I read the book of Job, his whole crisis was precipitated by his assumption that he had a transactional relationship with God. That if he did X and Y, then the Lord would do A and B. And there was this total reciprocity that he could expect every time he did something, he would receive an appropriate reward or recompense. And I think that's what is shattered when Elihu appears on the scene at the end of Job and says, who are you to think that God owes you anything? God doesn't bless you because he owes you something. He blesses you because he loves you. And your obedience should similarly be predicated on unexpecting love. And I think once we understand that the relationship is non-transactional, then we don't continue to measure our worthiness against some assumed standard. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, this is my experience. When, when I focus on a transactional, so if I do this, then, then it's almost that you have to, God. You have to bless me in this particular way. And this is the way that I want to be blessed. And so if you don't, and there's something very, very wrong with you. Um, and, and suddenly your relationship 
with God has changed dramatically. And you get, you're cross if you do something and you don't receive a blessing. And, and so you live your life like this. And it's, it's really, one, it's really damaging. It's certainly damaging to your relationship with God. But I think that if we know that God loves us absolutely, unyieldingly, that there is nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing that we are that is going to ameliorate his love in any way, then then we're not involved in these questions that really don't take us anywhere and we tend to live flat lives as a result. If we are secure in the love of God for us, then it emboldens us to go out and make a difference in the world, to try and share that love with other people. So we're not so myopic. And President Nelson used that word, this this idea of myopic, because his great granddaughter was hoping that, or you know, that you know, he was a prophet after all and he would heal. Um, but I think what President Nelson was saying, no, step back a little bit and 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 then and and go into that, see if this is really is God a magician, essentially. And I was so impressed with how much time she spent working through this, this idea of, and then this illumination, and then this strengthening of her faith. But that, I think that really comes from this belief at the very beginning, at the very heart, that God loves us absolutely. Then life is brighter. We are more courageous to step out um, into the world and, act, and live our baptismal covenants. And suddenly it's an all-embracing gospel rather than just a me-centered gospel. Yeah. yeah. I think it's interesting as you were talking, Fiona, I was considering what you were saying about, you know, the the transaction. And I think in other relationships in our lives, we recognize that if we are hoping to change someone or we only love them because we think we're going to get some sort of result from them that we, we, we recognize that's not a healthy relationship, but maybe in our relationship with God, we've gotten that confused and we don't recognize that we love him for who he is and he loves us for who we are. And not because we think that he needs to be an exact way or that he expects us to be an exact way. I love where you write, since we are apprentices of eternal life, remorse for falling short along the path is an appropriate response, not guilt. If guilt, if by guilt, we mean the preoccupation with unworthiness that is self-concerned and unproductive. Remorse, by contrast, is other concerned and is evidence of an empathy productive of greater holiness. And I just have never thought of it that way. And I wondered, how would you suggest that we approach our shortcomings with remorse rather than with guilt? Great question. Let me put that a little bit into historical context, maybe to help. Okay. One of the ways in which we can, I think, clearly tell that Christianity went off the rails a long time ago was with the development of the monastic tradition. Now, I don't mean to suggest for a moment that there weren't many beautiful, noble, virtuous souls in monasteries, but the very practice represented a retreat from the world and a quest for personal holiness which, as I understand it, is the antithesis of Jesus's principal teaching, which is you love God by loving each other, by being part of a community, by building relationships. And so that's just a sign of how prone we are to misconstrue personal righteousness with religion. Religion, right, ligari, the root, which means connectedness. And so I think that in this regard, President Nelson has really been inspired when he says that the quest for spirituality can become this selfish pursuit. Mother Teresa said the only reason we should pursue holiness is so that God can work through us more effectively to bless and minister to others. So I think it's a matter of keeping that perspective in mind and remembering that, uh, that, that we should be striving to be instruments and vehicles through whom God works and that, and that the pain that we cause to others is a just source of, of remorse for pain that we have caused. 
but that guilt always means that we're focusing too much on the self, letting ourselves down. How have I hampered my salvation? And I think keeping that distinction in mind can be helpful. It's been very helpful for me in my own life. When I, when I feel remorse, I want to go to the person and say, I, I am so sorry. Um, please help me make this right. When I feel guilt, it's, it's a shame. And I pull myself into myself and I don't want anybody to know. And I want the person whom I've offended to definitely not believe that I am actually feeling bad about what I just did. But, but again, this is a vocabulary. It, it, it's so important. Words carry so much meaning. And so, I mean, that's such a brilliant question. The, the idea of guilt, and as Cheryl said, is, is self-centered. Remorse is outward-centered. It's like you want to make things whole. I fear I may have, um, and, 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 and I wish I am sorry, and I wish to heal this breach. It's, it's such a little thing, but it's massive. Just absolutely. changing of the words. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's interesting how much you know, we talk about following the example of Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes we become caught up in the, the words and not so much the actions of Jesus Christ. But when you think about, you know, the whole idea of turning outward with everything that we do, that is true remorse. And, and, Jesus wouldn't want us to feel guilt. And so I love the way that you put that. And I'm not doing a very good job of articulating the thoughts that it generated for me. But I I want to, before we finish, one thing that I love about All Things New is that I really feel like it reframed for me the things that the restoration brings to light and how those things being brought to light invite light into our lives and hope. How do you both think that a study of the Doctrine and Covenants this year in Come Follow Me will strengthen people's understanding of the way that our religion makes things new? Well, I would suggest just this one thought. The first eight or ten sections in the Doctrine and Covenants seem to be this wildly kind of incommensurate, disparate group of revelations that are just put together in a haphazard order. But as I've studied those first 10 sections this year, I've recognized that there is one word, one concept that appears almost in every single one of those initial revelations. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Think about section four, for example. Every missionary typically memorizes section four, right? These are all the things that qualify you for the work. Okay, so there are 15 qualifications. But if you read section four carefully, there's only one qualification that calls you to the work. And that's if you have desires. Every section in those first dozen revelations is about desire. Oliver desires to translate. Joseph desires to lay the foundations. Peter desired to come to Christ swiftly when he died. John desired. So so it's as if at the launching of this new dispensation, what the Lord is saying is, if you will have the right desires, I will guide you safely through. And I think that if we understand the process of life as a process of repentance, but we understand repentance as a process of heart shaping or desire forging, then I think we can find that theme just pervasive in the Doctrine and Covenants, and that that can be the foundation of a re-engagement with the gospel in which we are open to letting Christ reshape our hearts and our desires as we move ahead. So beautifully said. Fiona? Oh, no, that was brilliant. (laughs) <laughs> I can't add to that. That was You're like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. That was really good. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I cannot tell you how much I have appreciated even just the chance to go through and prepare for this interview. And we have not even scratched the surface of the things that I could ask you about. But I just want you to know that I personally have felt my faith be strengthened by yours and am grateful for your scholarship and for sharing it with all of us. Before we finish, I just have one last question for you. And that is, what does it mean to 
to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, for me, all in the gospel of Jesus Christ is living the baptismal covenants. That means you're all in. It's um, you. you I, I feel like we've been invited by um, the Godhead to to work with them um, in 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 the healing and the, the bringing to pass of the immortality and eternal life of man, primarily in building Zion. And 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 so for me, being all in is yes. I do believe that every single individual on the earth ever now and will be is inherently divine and that heavenly our heavenly parents love each of us equally and what a wonderful what a wonderful being all in for me is creating zion is going to be a global zion and uh, you know reaching out to people of like minds like hearts Living those principles, essentially bearing each other's burdens, mourning and comforting, that for me is being all in. My take on being all in comes from my one of my lovely daughters who taught me this important lesson as she herself was climbing another peak in her faith journey. She called me one day with a kind of jubilant tone in her voice. She said, Dad, today I was reading the parable of the treasure in the field. And I think I learned something important. The man, when he found there was a treasure in the field, he went and sold everything he had so that he could buy it. And if you think about a typical field, you're going to get cow manure and old boots and license plates, and but there's a treasure in the midst of it. And I think that that's a wonderful apt analogy for uh, a church that is filled with fallible people and wonderful inspired leaders who have at times erred, scriptures that aren't always inerrant. But if we recognize the treasure at its heart, as I believe I do, then I'm willing to be all in and buy the whole field in order to have that treasure. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. Terrell and Fiona, thank you for spending this time with me. I have really appreciated it. Thank you, Morgan. We are so grateful to Fiona and Terrell for joining us on today's episode. You can find many of their books, including their latest, All Things New, in Deseret Bookstores now. A huge thank you to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this episode. And thank you, as always, for listening. We'll look forward to being with you again next week.